This is the triangle. It's 420 feet from home plate, the furthest point on the field, and its tight corners mean that any well-placed hit will bounce around long enough to secure a likely triple. It's the bane of outfielders everywhere, and by everywhere I mean only Boston, Massachusetts, because like many horrible things, the triangle only exists in Boston. Fenway Park, the home of the Boston Red Sox, is the only MLB field shaped like this, and it's the only one to feature the triangle. But it's not unique in its uniqueness. In fact, all 30 MLB stadiums across the country are completely different. They have different sizes, different shapes, and yes, even slightly different rules. But why aren't there standards governing the size or shape of a ballpark, and how do they keep the game consistent when the stadiums aren't? Well, before we get into the very weird ways that the MLB deals with this problem, it's worth explaining why this sort of problem is unique to baseball. Just as an example, let's talk about the standards that your average NFL field has to meet before a bunch of very large anthropology majors can concuss each other on it. As laid out in the NFL rulebook, every single NFL field is exactly 120 yards long and 53 and one third yards wide, with goal lines established 10 yards in from each end line. Within 72 hours of any game, they measure the firmness of the field and then measure the depth of infill, that carcinogenic confetti stuff, in 40 different places to make sure that the ground is perfectly level. The fields are regularly tested for moisture level, grass coverage, and even the strength of the grass roots to ensure that every NFL game, with very few exceptions, is played on an essentially physically identical field. And similar standards apply to pretty much any professional sport you can think of. That is, except for baseball. The reasons for this are complicated, but that's why you've got YouTubers like me to simplify it enough that everyone who actually cares about baseball will absolutely eviscerate me in the comments section. Basically, baseball is old. It's the oldest professional sport in the United States, apart from shooting British people, and as such, it's carried with it some quirks of the past. When baseball stadiums were first being built in the late 19th century, Americans hadn't yet realized that they could all be living in really ugly, identical housing developments in the middle of nowhere, and were forced to live in tightly knit, walkable cities instead. As a result, baseball stadiums were being built the only place that they'd be accessible, in city centers where they could be reached by foot or horse or Flintstones car. The problem with this, however, was that urban land was limited. These stadiums were being built in the middle of pre-existing neighborhoods and designed around complicated municipal infrastructure, so much like an insecure NYU student, these parks had to get really weird to fit in in the big city. These were later dubbed jewel box parks and were known for their unconventional shapes, two of which are still in use today, the previously mentioned Fenway Park and Wrigley Field in Chicago. As suburbs started to develop in the 40s and stadiums could be built in less claustrophobic conditions on the outer edges of cities, you started to see large, multi-purpose stadiums like the Oakland Coliseum. These tended to be more symmetrical, but weren't optimized for baseball. That meant that they had other sorts of quirks, like huge foul territories in parts of stadiums that weren't meant to be used. Then, around the 60s and 70s, you started to see smaller parks pop up designed specifically for baseball, like Dodger Stadium, and by the 90s and 2000s, quirky, asymmetrical parks like Camden Yards came back in fashion because Baltimore had no other way of convincing people that they were cool again. The point is, baseball stadiums have been around for a long time, much longer than stadiums for most other sports, so there's been a lot of architectural inconsistency over a century's worth of urban development, cultural revolution, and fluctuating interest in watching men in tight pants run in circles. And while there have been pushes in the past to standardize, it would mean spending an obscene amount of money to abandon some of the sport's most iconic and beloved venues, so instead, the MLB opted for the simple solution. Create 30 slightly different versions of baseball that are impossible to memorize but technically account for every single difference in every single stadium. Easy. These unique variations on the game are called ground rules, a stadium-specific rule set for each different ballpark in the MLB. Now, some of these rules are used to determine what exactly is part of the field and what isn't. For example, a ball that hits this camera in Oakland is out of play, but a ball that hits this camera in Baltimore is in play. But there are also rules that can completely alter the way that the game plays out on a given field. Hitting this ladder at Fenway Park, for example, awards the batter an automatic double. Same goes if they get the ball stuck in this ivy at Wrigley Field. Hitting the upper catwalks at Tropicana Field means the ball is still in play, but hitting the lower catwalks is an automatic home run. If you bat a ball into the top part of this wall at PNC Park and it ricochets over this other wall, that's a home run. But if your ball hits the bottom part of the wall and it makes the same bounce, it's only a double. And if you knock the ball out of Nationals Park in DC and it creams all the way into the west wing of the White House and hits Joe Biden in the head, killing him instantly, then you technically score a home run, but you also probably end up going to prison. So the next time your friend thinks that they know all the rules to baseball, they don't. And you should just smugly bring up this video to prove them wrong and ruin your friendship for no reason. 
So I have to do a lot of the research for these videos while I'm traveling, and especially when you're dealing with highly local information like the stuff in this video, doing that research abroad can be a huge headache. I've mentioned this before, but back in 2018, the EU rolled out a new set of internet regulations to protect European citizens' data, but American websites that didn't want to meet these standards just ended up blocking all of Europe instead, and that would have made writing this video impossible if we didn't have NordVPN. With Nord, we were able to change our location to the US with just a click. It was effortlessly easy, and there would have been no other way for us to access those kind of sketchy websites. And better yet, with their threat protection features, it can alert me when one of those emails from my bank or social media is, in fact, a sketchy phishing attempt. I was skeptical about using VPNs before, I figured they'd just slow me down and get in the way, but my experience with Nord has been totally seamless. It's the fastest VPN on the planet, and you'd hardly notice that it's there. If you use the internet outside of the home at all, at the coffee shop, on the train, at a co-working space, and are worried about the security of your accounts, you should really consider trying out NordVPN. And hey, if it doesn't work out or you don't get enough use out of it, you don't need to worry. Nord offers a 30-day money-back guarantee. So click the button on screen or follow the link in the description and try out Nord today.